In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, and our Mother, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Fireside with Fathers. So happy you're all there. Uh, today, I'm very excited with our guest. Um, as we announced last week, it's a pleasure that we have David Wemhoff with us. Um, David, we're going to give him a, his, his bio um, in a bit here. But um, it's a very interesting topic because it has to do with um, doctrinal warfare and this this very popular word now, uh, infiltration and all these attempts uh, basically for the gates of hell to overthrow the kingdom of Christ and his church. Um, so this is going to be a very powerful hour, I hope. And so like everybody, feel free if you guys have questions, um, comments, or you know, you'd like something further explained, feel free to drop that in. And we will be putting David's book in the description and the link below. So David, thank you so much for uh, for joining us tonight. I know you're a busy man in spite of, of COVID-19 and everything, but uh, we really appreciate your time and coming on the show. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Father. And uh, it is my honor and privilege and pleasure to be here. So you are uh, you you're wouldn't be as restricted there in Indiana, I think, as we are here in Ireland. We have a 5K thing, so we're not allowed 5K out of our house. I don't know if it's that bad for you in Indiana. <laughs> we... Uh... We uh, we are um, I guess that there things are getting better here, so we have uh, more time to go out of our house. Only right now we're having a sleet storm, so you don't want to go outside of our yeah. house. Yes, we had one yesterday morning. It was a it was a typical Irish morning with the sleet, snow, and then the sunshine. So people are getting ready for spring just because the sun the sun did come out, but. Um, so, Dave, what I'll do is um, I'm going to give you a quick little intro here. Uh, you have a very long uh, biographical sketch, but um, it's up on online as well. I'm assuming you guys, if you always just like you can just Google Dave Wemhoff um, and it will come up. But um, we'll just give you a quick intro here. And uh, David Wemhoff is an attorney engaged in the private practice of law with an emphasis on civil litigation, criminal defense and business transactions. He received an A.B. in government from the University of Notre Dame and a Juris Doctor from the University of the Pacific McGeorge School of Law. Mr. Wemhoff earned a Master's of Law in International and Comparative Law from Indiana University in May 2019. He is admitted to practice in Indiana, California, and before a number of federal courts to include the Supreme Court of the United States, and has been a practicing lawyer for nearly 30 years. In December 2017, Mr. Wemhoff was named a Life Fellow of the Indiana Bar Foundation for Excellence and Service. Mr. Wemhoff is the author of John Courtney Murray, Time, Life, and the American Proposition. This book was seven years in the making, includes material from more than 30 collections of personal and official papers, references over 500 additional sources, and is 990 pages in length. Uh, there's a little description here I want to read. Uh, this is from Dr. Diane Kirby. Uh, she's a reader in history at the University of Ulster, Northern Ireland. So this is what uh, Diane says. David A. Wemhoff has devoted 990 pages of meticulous and painstaking research to illustrate his proposition that America sought to recruit the world's religions as part of a strategy to disseminate American ideology around the world during the Cold War. His focus is on the Roman Catholic Church, which not only had a global presence, but one accessible leader who shared with the United States, a, who shared with the United States a mutual antipathy towards communism and the Soviet Union. Key to this process was the publisher Henry Luce, or Luce. And Wemhoff has raised so many contentious issues and identified such a wealth of archival sources replete with intriguing correspondence. It seems highly likely that enterprising scholars will pay far more attention to Murray and indeed to church-state relations more generally. At the same time, his research is an important contribution to that of a cohort of scholars addressing the religious component in America's Cold War 
divided by whether it reflected American ambition and interest or American goodness and morality. Wemhoff's work certainly reinforces the arguments of the former. All right, so um, what we're hopefully going to get into here is um, it, if you could describe um, to like the listeners the attempt of this infiltration like through doctrinal warfare like i mean what i want to do is i just want to give you the floor and hopefully you can you know in 45 minutes basically go through your 990 page book in a, a summary form but hopefully focusing here on the you know the, the second vatican council and this the attempt of doctrinal warfare oh well thank you very much father well doctrinal warfare uh became ideological warfare uh, and what it is, um, is something that is still being practiced today. Uh, and what you do is uh, the uh, proponent of a certain doctrine uses all means available to advance that doctrine. Um, because if you, you might remember uh, from recently with the uh, war against uh, the Islamic State, uh, there was discussion of a, of a doctrinal warfare or uh, an ideological warfare with the members of the um, uh, of ISIS, well, uh, the Americans used doctrinal warfare uh, back during the Cold War, uh, beginning uh, after World War II, and uh, doctrinal warfare was something that was targeted uh, particularly at religions, the major religions at the world of the world. And I had an opportunity to look at a lot of declassified documents and. Uh, get declassified a number of U.S. documents that indicated that the U.S. government um, targeted officially uh, the religions of the world and also, too, any opposition system, not just Soviet communism. Soviet communism was the boogeyman that uh, everybody was supposed to be on the lookout against and to be afraid of. Uh, and the, so the threat of Soviet communism then justified the ideological or doctrinal warfare. Um, and so what the doctrinal warfare uh, was aimed at doing was to get the major religions of the world to accept as good in principle the American system of social organization. The American system of social organization is known as liberalism with a capital L. It is basically an idea that says we can do it without God, without an established religion. That, we, that mankind can really just kind of work things out in a society because we'll know the right thing to do. And so we're going to have things like free speech and free press and religious liberty and no state-established church, no state-established religion. Okay, well, what does that uh, look like in the United States? It's, the heart of that is in the First Amendment. You find something similar uh, to the First Amendment in other constitutions, too. You just have to look for it. It was in the Soviet Constitution, a form of it's in the Constitution of the People's Republic of China. But the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, says, quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances, end of quote. That sounds great, doesn't it? Aren't we all in favor of that? Well, the idea, the problem with that and the idea behind it, as it has certainly come to be used, is that it's a way for very powerful private interests in society to weaken the authority and to weaken the power, not just of the government, but also of the church, the Catholic church and other churches as well. But I mean, primarily the Catholic church. One thing that the powerful private interests don't want, and nowadays you can call them, I call them the tyrant billionaires, uh, because they are basically intent on controlling all aspects of our lives. Uh, and I think we're seeing that to a degree with, with the discussions of the Great Reset, the COVID-19 situation, uh, and uh, you know the entire discussion of, of climate change, which is rather frightening. Um, so you're, you're seeing these powerful private interests that want to control a society. And they're two traditional opponents to the powerful pri private interests. In other words, the really wealthy who have got appetites, you know, to accumulate more and more because they're so greedy. Um, the two real checks on their power have always been strong government leaders and the Catholic Church. 
And both of these are somewhat authoritarian and hierarchical, and they've been very effective for most of history in basically controlling the appetites of the powerful private interests. Now, there's, there's, a, there's a twist here. Um, during the Cold War, the Americans, I submit, actually invented the idea of globalism. And there were two meetings in, in May of 1952 and May of 1954 at Princeton, New Jersey, that um, officially had a number of representatives of finance, the intelligence communities, the U.S. government, um, and also to the media in attendance. Uh, uh, officially, it was they were unofficially there, but what they were doing is they were laying the groundwork for uh, inserting... Uh, American-style systems of social organization, I mean the First Amendment, in countries around the globe, which would not only knock out the Soviets, but also weaken the Catholic Church. So the Americans had to get the Catholic Church to adopt as good in principle the First Amendment, and that is what my book deals with in some detail. And so when you said you declassified, I'm assuming you're talking about the CIA. How do you go about declassifying something from the CIA? Isn't that all top secret? Uh, well, there are actually a couple of ways to do it. Um, and I used the quickest way, and that took uh, more than three years. Um, and the document was PSB D33. Uh, which stands for a Psychological Strategy Board Document 33. Um, that came out uh, in June of 1953. It had an annex. It, it, it described the entire doctrinal warfare, the targets, the purpose. And it had an annex, an annex B, that dealt with the involvement of the CIA. That was the, the juicy part we wanted, and they declassified it. And it showed that... Uh, the CIA would work to exploit, and they used the word heresies and divergencies in uh, opposition systems. And opposition systems means anything that isn't liberalism. So an opposition um, system in this case would be the Catholic Church. Absolutely. The Catholic Church and the Catholic religion, because the Catholic religion restricts or puts a damper on the appetites and the desires and the lust and the greed of the powerful private interests, the tyrant billionaires. So how'd they go about um, sowing these heresies or like what was their method of, of infiltration or doctrinal warfare within the Catholic Church? Well, there's two ways they do it. One is clandestine and one is out in the open. Um, and so uh, what uh, the clandestine part involved uh, a guy by the name of Felix Morleone. He was a Dominican. <clears throat> and he was uh, actually propped up and paid for by the OSS. He also received money from the CIA in the 1950s. Uh, and he launched something called Prodeo University, which was in Rome. And it had the approval of a lot of church officials. And, and basically what it did is it taught students, um, from, especially from Latin America, community leaders uh, like businessmen, um, uh, professionals, it taught them that the American system of social organization, the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution with the First Amendment uh, and the other parts of the Bill of Rights was the ideal of social organization. And then it packed them back off to their um, to their countries. And so they had these ideas in their head of how we have to remake our countries to be like America. That's the clandestine part. The. Um, it was kind of funny because I came across uh, declassified documents um, where the the chief of the PSB, the Psychological Strategy Board, I'm diverging a little bit before I get into the open uh, means of communication. The chief of the Psychological Strategy Board was a good Catholic by the name of Dr. Edward Lilly. Dr. Lilly came from a very wealthy American family, and he was very instrumental in setting up the doctrinal warfare program that ultimately targeted the Catholic Church. Um, he was also tied into a lot of Jesuits, uh, and also he knew the Grace family, which was also very wealthy and very much cooperated clandestinely with the CIA. But at one point, Dr. Lilly was looking for some Catholic theologian to spread the word about the First Amendment being the ideal, and somebody gave him the name of John Courtney Murray, and he went and found out, oh, John Courtney Murray is already doing something along those lines. 
Uh, John Courtney Murray was never a member of the CIA, as I could find, but he did work for Henry Luce. Henry Luce was the founder of Time Life, but Henry Luce uh, and his company was called Time Inc. Henry Luce also um, worked very closely with the CIA, and his number one um, consultant, lieutenant, if you will, was a guy called Charles D. Um, uh, Jackson, C.D. Jackson, who basically taught the U.S. government about psychological or political warfare. And psychological or political warfare, as C.D. Jackson put it, is using uh, events that are very open and spinning them. That's really what he's talking about. He's talking about spinning them. Um, and so um, a lot of what Time, Inc. and Henry Luce did was simply to publish their magazine and spin events. That's it. Now, that was always coordinated uh, somewhat with the CIA. I mean, the CIA is putting out the same message, and uh, Time, Inc. is putting out the same message. And, um, but they're both very effective for different reasons. And what got a lot of people to change their mind um, about uh, uh, the proper organization of society, to change their mind to think that the Catholic doctrine of church and state changed, um, was reading newspapers and magazines, like watching the nightly news. Uh, that's what changed a lot of people's minds. I was going to say just and for, it, sorry, David, I don't want to cut you off. You're, you're doing, oh, go ahead. I just know just to give no, maybe someone an idea, like when you say time Inc and time life, maybe just a millennial or someone who would be listening. If just, how would you compare that? Like what that, what that was as far as like a, you know, means of communication to something now, what would that be like? Just to give someone an idea who wouldn't really be familiar with time life. No, I mean, it would be uh, any of the multiple news services on, on your handheld device. I mean, you can, um, I, you know, you could you could go to any any newspaper that's online or any news service online, and you're going to see uh, a narrative. Here in the U.S., you have the mainstream, mainstream media, the MSM, uh, ABC, CBS, uh, NBC, CNN, Fox. That's five. I think there's one more. Um, but they're the guys who basically put out the narrative. They put out the message, and it's consistently, it's consistently the same. Uh, they even use the same word. After January 6th, the event at the Capitol, uh, everybody agreed to use the word insurrection. It took about a day to figure that out, and it was kind of funny to listen to them because they kept going back between riot and you know uh, whatever. But they all agreed on insurrection within 24 hours, and so. Uh, of course, you know, legally, um, I don't think it meets the standard of being an insurrection. But uh, any means of communication, any means of social communication, nowadays, I'm sure that um, doctrinal warfare is being waged through social media, through Twitter, through Facebook, through uh, you name it, uh, whatever they got. Uh, and people are part of it's being waged there. So the hidden way to get in there and to spread the heresies, they got their man. So Henry Luce and, and John Courtney Murray, what's you were just, I think, saying the relationship there between those two guys. Yeah, those guys became pretty close. Um, you know, I, um, I in in uh, the spring of 1948, um, Henry Luce had a meeting with a Louis Finkelstein or a rabbi. And present at that meeting was a man by the name of John Shaw Billings. And John Shaw Billings was um, a very important associate of Luce, but he really he, he really wasn't in the inner circle for a lot of things. But he was at that meeting, and he said, you know, I, I'm I'm looking at Rabbi Finkelstein, and and he looks he he kind of looks like an ascetic Jesus, and he's writing this in his diary. But then he says, um, you know, the heart of the discussion was how you get people to like the United States. And um, Henry Luce was very clear. He said, I need a theologian. So that theologian was John Courtney Murray. And within weeks um, of that meeting that I just described, there was a secret meeting at the Biltmore Hotel, which I don't think stands there anymore in, in New York. It was April 26, 1948. It was a secret meeting. There were no minutes that came out of it, except for one set of minutes that ended up in the files of Father Francis Connell who was a Catholic redemptorist uh, priest in the United States who opposed what Murray was saying. And in that meeting, it was very clear Murray was there. And Murray said, um, hey, um, yeah, you know, the Catholic doctrine on church and state, yeah, we can change it. It's not locked in stone. Um, because the other people that were there were Protestants. 
uh, Jews and a lot of well-heeled Americans that were there. And they wanted a change in the doctrine uh, because at the same time this was going on, you had um, Paul Blanchard writing uh, his very popular uh, pieces about how the Catholic Church is very bad for society. Spain is the boogeyman. And, uh, you know, this is 1948. And so we, we really have to keep the Catholics out of power. And so the heart of the discussion was how do you organize society? What is religious liberty? Do you have an established church? And if so, what are the public policies supposed to be based on? So, so John Courtney Murray was found by, uh, by Luce. I think it was through Cardinal Spellman actually, that the introduction was made. From what I could tell, it was not very clear, uh, but that was my surmise, that Cardinal Spellman introduced Murray to um, Luce, and Cardinal Spellman was the cardinal in New York City. He worked just a couple hundred yards from Henry Luce, and they would go to lunch on a regular basis. I saw that in all their diaries. And so there was clearly uh, a connection there. And uh, Spellman was very much Americanist. He very much favored the American system of social organization. Um, and, uh, and Murray was very glad to be able to advance that. So Murray was the guy. And so there formed what I call a, a somewhat unholy trinity, which was Henry Luce, his wife, Claire Booth Luce, who converted to Catholicism and was very popular at the time. And then John Courtney Murray, a Jesuit. And John Courtney Murray is partly credited with bringing Claire Booth Luce into the Catholic faith as, as is uh, uh, Bishop Sheen. This was 1946, 47. Um, so about that time, they've made the connection, and, um, and Luce starts to uh, build up Murray and his magazines as a progressive, intelligent, brilliant thinker. And so this all leads, so he's got his man, um, and what's his relation with the council, like, where does this come into play with with the council? Because we're we're saying we probably have to fast forward now, maybe a decade or so. But what's their relationship with the Second Vatican Council? Well, um, Murray ended up going to the Second Vatican Council as a Pariti, of course, at the bequest of Cardinal Spellman, uh, and this was in 1963. Um, uh, Murray had been censored. Um, because of att he attacked Cardinal Ottaviani, uh, who was the um, head of the Holy Office, um, which is the precursor of the CDF, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. So he had attacked um, Ottaviani in a speech in March of 1954. So, so Murray gets censored. Spellman gets him into Vatican II. And uh, Murray comes up with the plan. The American Catholic bishops were the shock troops. And uh, Cardinal Cushing was the leader. And the idea was to change the doctrine uh, of the church when it came to the proper relation of church and state um, uh, relations. And the way to do that, according to Murray, was to use this idea of freedom, um, you know, that you have maximum freedom uh, in a situation like America, and that's the best thing for the church. That's all the church wants anyways. Um, and that this is the natural law. Well, Cardinal, I'm sorry, Father Connell and uh, Monsignor Joseph Fenton and Monsignor Shea, George Shea, they all op opposed uh, Murray's position in the 50s, saying that that was not the natural law, that every society had an obligation to the divine positive law. And the divine positive law is the Catholic faith. Um, every society has that obligation. And that's what came out of Vatican II. Uh, in a number of documents. And the two documents you really have to look at are Intermerifica and uh, Dignitatis Humanae. When you say, just to get a bit of a, just a clarity, so when you say, so Murray was pushing for natural law and um, the divine positive law was what would be in the Catholic mm, point of view, but you, what would you say, like natural law, what was his idea of natural law? What does that mean? Well, well, <laughs> I think that's kind of what Monsignor Shea said. He said, Murray doesn't know what he's talking about. There's no such idea of natural law without a state-established church or without a, a church established. He said, the history of mankind shows that you've always had an established church going all the way back to, to the pharaohs and, and to Babylon. You always had an established church. You always had hearth and, hearth and our altar. You always had those two things in the public sphere. So he said what Murray was talking about was, was absolutely nonsense. Uh, it, was, it was not natural law. Uh, and in fact, Murray admitted to the Rockefellers in June of 1957 that, you know what, what I'm proposing, 
uh, is in line with the liberal tradition of the West, which is liberalism. So, you know, he really wasn't being honest. Um, and he even wrote a letter to Claire Booth Luce saying, you know what, we're going to treat the, the requirement of the Catholic doctrine of the divine positive law as something that is simply um, not, um, um, it, it is simply time. It's limited to a certain period in time. And uh, we are going to set out the uh, principles that are applicable for all time. And this is what the church should go with. So the natural law that Murray was talking about really wasn't a natural law. The, the natural law on the organization of society um, is something that, as you know, that, that St. Thomas Aquinas talked about with his five initial precepts, you know, and that is um, you have a right to, to self-preservation to exist. Uh, you have a right to reproduce, a right to have a family and educate that family, a right to culture and a right to worship God. And so you have to build a society based on those precepts. And that it comes into the public sphere. Uh, and Murray was saying, no, the First Amendment, you have no established church. You have a system of democracy like in the United States. You let all the churches do what they want, and they'll just simply, uh, you know, teach people to do the right thing, which, of course, is nonsense. It was a total corruption of the natural law. It was not the natural law, uh, according to Monsignor Shea. So he goes in as an expert, and he's backed by some some pretty influential, you know, big guys like behind him. And who is he influencing? Because if he goes out there to Rome, like like who is he gonna? Why would America have an impression really on anybody, or or who would it be that they would be having an impression on in in the as far as like the fathers and the the bishops and the council? Well, he won over all the Americans. Um, there's no doubt about that, and um, just about all the Americans. Um, and he, there were a lot of, uh, Germans and Northern Europeans, um, uh, Belgians, French, uh, and Dutch who went along, uh, with his postulations. And, um, there were some discussions with him, him and Eves Congar, and actually him and Eves Congar did not agree. Um, Pope Paul VI actually weighed in on the document which infuriated uh, uh, Murray and the Americans. Um, and I, I think that, you know, uh, Pope Paul actually in many ways probably saved the document. At one point he is uh, to have said, according to Monsignor Fenton, the Pope is to have said that uh, this thing is full of heresy. <laughs> I mean, we can't promote heresy. And so uh, he was instrumental in, in making changes to that document. So the whole idea. Plus, plus sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Keep going. Keep I'm going. sorry, Father. I, I, there's, there's one other thing I, I need to say. You need to understand that that the Vatican II Council, when it occurred and where it occurred, it occurred in '62 to '65. That was 17 to 20 years after the end of World War II. That was the bloodiest war ever fought anywhere, especially it was fought in Europe. You know, 50 million people died. So the winner of that war was the United States of America. Everybody else lost everybody. But the Americans won. And the Americans had the power to pump out this idea through their media um, of how great a system America was. And actually, ground zero of the American effort was occupied Germany. And of ground zero in occupied Germany was Munich. And there was a young priest there by the name of Joseph Ratzinger, who was in his very formative years listening to the American media and reading the American magazines. So this is what was going on at the time. And this is how and the Americans influenced the Pariti and the bishops uh, and the fathers of the council to a degree. But the Holy Spirit is stronger than the Americans. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was important, that point you made, because there was a boom and everybody was looking over there. And so you could see why they would say, well, these guys really do have the Holy Spirit and they do have like the real, you know, it's the real deal there. And um, I think I've heard you say before that, you know, there's that famous, the book, the um, the Rhine flows into the Tiber. But I think you say that the it was the Potomac that flew into the Rhine. So uh, that would be the river that goes like, into, there's it's in Washington, uh, in D.C. and Virginia, right? So it would be like the influence yeah. that the Americans had on the German, because we would always hear that, like in Vatican II, there was, you know, the Germans and like, you know, how they overpowered and bullied. And you can just see, they, you know, them basically trying to get their way in the council but you could see that it's probably because there was there was an inspiration or a desire to be with this you know the american dream and the what you were saying with the no would that be would that be accurate 
I think that's absolutely accurate. There was a, a married couple, I think one of them is deceased now, the Merits. They taught at the University of Illinois. They did two incredible books uh, where they studied the effect of American post-war propaganda from 1945 to 1965, I think, at least to 1960. And they, they documented all the results. And you could see how the German public opinion changed in favor of the American system of social organization. Incredible, incredible work that these two people did. So at the end, you said that the Holy Spirit was stronger than the Americans. And um, so, like, we're... I mean, after Vatican II, you know, like everything that came about it, what would you say to somebody that was saying, like, well, how is the Holy Spirit more powerful than, than the CIA or the infiltration? Wasn't it at the end of the day infiltrated and we're just reaping the fruits now from that? Um, I, I think what happened um, is that there were... What you have is the leadership or a large parts of the leadership of the Catholic Church. And by that, I mean priests and prelates. And, and I think even the Pope, have bought into the idea that the Catholic uh, vision of social organization with the confessional state, which is a state that is recognized by the state as, as the only church and where the policies of the state are based on the Roman Catholic faith or the divine positive law, um, that idea is not workable, that idea is not acceptable, that idea is no longer the ideal. Uh, so what you have now is the Catholic leadership views the American system of social organization as the ideal. As a minimum, they don't think it can ever, ever be changed. So they're beaten in a way before they even begin. But, but they, they think that uh, America is the ideal, and the leadership believes that, but they're, they're not even reading their own documents. Now, I will say, and I think there's a part of my book where I talk about some of the documents of the Vatican II Council were written in an epideictic style, which is kind of a big flowing uh, visionary uh, style, uh, not really uh, in a legal style where there are definitions and clear statements. However, there are some clear statements that bear directly on what we're talking about. One came out of Intermorifica, and it's paragraph six, and I was just looking at that to quote it, because the council made a very profound declaration. It's in paragraph six of Intermorifica, and I bet most people don't even know what Intermorifica is. Intermorifica was the very first document to come out. It's, it is entitled uh, the, um, the Decree on the Means of Social Communication, uh, and it came out in December of 1963, and John Courtney Murray was furious about it. The Americans were furious about it uh, because it limited the power of the media, you see. And it said the power of the media and the, uh, has to be limited by the church and by the state. Uh, so anyways, paragraph six makes a very clear statement of the moral obligation of every society. And it says, quote, the council proclaims that all must accept the absolute primacy of the objective moral order, period. Now it goes on, it's end of quote. It goes on to say, it alone is superior to and is capable of harmonizing all forms of human activity, not accepting art, no matter how noble in themselves. Um, if the moral order is fully and faithfully observed, it leads man to full perfection and happiness. In Dignitatis Humanae, um, there is a statement which is pretty clear, um, and it's in the, the first um, section, paragraph three. Um, Actually, first section, paragraph two, it says, the sacred council begins by professing that God himself has made known to the human race how men by serving him can be saved and reach happiness in Christ. We believe that this one true religion continues to exist in the Catholic and apostolic church to which the Lord Jesus entrusted the task of spreading it among all men. And then in paragraph three, it, it uh, describes what Dignitatis Humanae is, um, and it says uh, that the document, quote, leaves intact the traditional Catholic teaching on the moral duty of individuals and societies towards the true religion and the one church of Christ. End of quote. So there's a very clear declaration. So there, with this clarity, um, what would the protagonists of these, um, I mean, these guys were trying to spread the heresies. 
um, what was their reaction after that? Like, what was their what was their game plan after the documents came out? Like, how do how do they put a spin on this? What was their spin or their angle? Um, well, you know, <laughs> it's kind of like the Vietnam War in the United States. You know, you make peace, you say you won, and he left. Uh, so what these guys did is they basically said, oh, well, you know what? We got what we wanted. And so uh, it was spun that way in the press, though there was some criticism of Paul VI. Um, it was spun that way in the press. And more importantly, it was spun that way in the Abbott version and in other versions, uh, early versions of the um, council documents that came out. Of note, uh, John Courtney Murray wrote commentary concerning um, the Dignitas Humanae, uh, and he wrote commentary in which he said, well, this means that basically the First Amendment is the ideal, and that's all the Catholic leadership had for several years after that, until Austin Flannery came up with his version in 1975, and John Cardinal Wright wrote the introduction saying, um, basically, you know, we're, we're being told a lot of stuff that is simply not true. Um, uh, he said that um, in the first versions, the council documents were frequently accompanied by commentary or reactions, usually friendly and helpful to further lines of independent thought, but frequently irrelevant and even confusing to one seeking to learn exactly what the council said rather than what someone outside the council thought about the matter. So what you had then was a discussion on the interpretation of the documents after 1965. And this was telegraphed by Mr. Vischer, who was the president of the World Council of Churches. He said, okay, now we have to properly, you know, we have to now properly uh, interpret these documents. Uh, but, you know, the church has agreed it's just one of many religions, which is a total lie. And so what you had after Vatican II was a dissembling of the documents. You had the spinning of the documents uh, into meanings that they were never meant to have. So in that sense, these these big elites or, you know, whoever's it was in their interest to, to get this doctrinal warfare, at the end of the day, if you can convince the, the church that they themselves don't believe that they can be an, an authority in a state or have a say, um, you basically won because that, you don't enter into, like, my economy or you don't enter into other different parts of my life because at the end of the day, like— you really don't have a say there at the end of the day it's it's like natural law you know that's if that's kind of what they 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 spun out that would just be like i guess not what came from vatican II, but rather what the press and the media created as a spirit of vatican II. so that would be basically what we would be we would living now but what would you say to somebody because i know look there's loads of people out there that um on a personal level in their faith uh, the COVID-19 lockdown has affected it um, simply because there hasn't been a lot of masses and there's been more, you know, um, availability within, like, you know, I think the SSPX would be what, one that just never closed. And, you know, people started going over there. They started listening to a lot of podcasts and um, they're pretty much convinced that Vatican II is not from God. It's not from the Holy Spirit. And it's basically, we just have to throw it all, all away. So in your, you know, you researched the stuff, you got in there, you saw, you know, three years declassifying documents, you've seen what they've been trying to do. What would you say to somebody that would be going through that right now that just wants to throw it all into the bin, Vatican II, and, and just say that it's, it's been infiltrated, it's, it's not from God? What would you, what would you say to somebody like that? Don't do it. Don't do it. Um, you know, what you want to know is um, Catholic doctrine. Uh, Catholic doctrine cannot change. It cannot be changed. It can be developed. I mean, you can get a clearer idea of it, but, you, but it is not to be changed. And it cannot be changed. And the council did not change it. Um, you have to read things very closely. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it came out in 1992, um, explains in a roundabout way the traditional, if you will, the doctrine of the church when it comes to church and state relations. Um, it is easy to despair. It is easy to believe the mainstream media and even to a large extent, you know, Father, the Catholic media just parrots the mainstream media. 
and we saw that beginning in the 1960s with Vatican II Council, they're going to repeat error. So you have to get um, good books and you got to read those. You got to read the ones that talk about what the doctrine of the church is. And I think they were more clearly written before Vatican II. I think Father Francis Connell wrote a number of really good books that were very clearly written uh, that will help you understand. And uh, I think, you know, when it comes to religious liberty and the church and state relations, you have to read the encyclicals of Leo uh, the Thirteenth, particularly Immortali Dei, uh, which came out, I think, in 1880 or 1885. And Longinqua Oceani, you've got to read that one. That's from 1895 where the Pope clearly states the proper means of social organization. Um, and I think that will get you on the way um, to knowing what the truth is. What's really disheartening is so many of the church leaders simply don't know the doctrine or they don't speak the doctrine or um, they confuse people. And we are living in terrible times. There's no doubt about that. But you have to stay true to that doctrine. And if the Pope pronounces it, especially Leo the 13th, um, and on church and state relations, that's who you go with. Yeah, no, um, you're right. And I think it is now more than ever because there's so much availability of, of, I don't know, information or disinformation or, you know, people that just have all this access and now all this time. Um, and then there is a confusion, you know, like what's going on? Is he saying this or is he saying that? And then people start digging themselves and at the end of the day it, it seems like they're they're almost even jumping ship like i mean i don't know i just in my opinion it seems like the, the ship of peter has always been on rocky waters i think when the lord said one of the interpretations we've got in seminary was the the gates of hell when he said that that the gates of hell will will come at you but they will not prevail they said that the, right. the gates of a city were the most powerful part of that city because it was the most vulnerable. Like it was the part where the enemy could get in. So it was the part where the most weapons and concentration of forces had to be. So it's basically the strongest hell has, they're going to throw it against the church since the birth of the church, since the beginning. And it's if you just look a bit through history, it's been rocking back and forth. Even with the councils, there's been people after the councils that have not, you know, they've not been agreeing with them. He's he's a genius at what he does, the evil one, and I feel like the same thing's going on now. Like they're they're going to be rocking it, they're going to be throwing everything they have, but the last thing you want to do is jump out because you know, if if it's being rocked by such rocky wavy waters, you know, imagine when you jump out, you know, that's you're going to be in the midst of them, and it's just going to be slowly just leading you off into confusion. So, I think more than ever, it is important to go back to. Um, go back to the documents and like you said you just pulled out two examples there of what it said and what the spin on it or what the spirit tried to interpret it from you know like and just and be wary of that these forces are there doctrinal warfare exists it has its intention and it has its purpose and it has its finality and they're very efficacious like the children of the dark are good at what they do and um i think it's not the time where we just be let ourselves be led by by any any you know anybody out there who just has a couple things to say about Vatican II, and then you're just you know you're swallowing it hook line and sinker. I, I just think that's so dangerous, especially in these these times. So Dave, there's a couple questions here. Hopefully we can um, we can get, and then uh, we'll see. We'll take it from there. So we'll just I'll have a, we'll pull a couple questions up here. Two seconds. Sure. Um, I think you're absolutely right, Father. I think that. People have got to uh, read read the, the source documents. This is the Flannery version in paperback, um, where you can actually, you know, see what was what the words were. It it helps have an understanding, um, you know, of of the doctrine because you have to, in many cases, operate from that point of view. There's a whole industry that's grown up with people criticizing Vatican II, um, and it's been used as a wedge issue. So I absolutely agree with you. Okay, so. Here's a question from James Damasi. He's my he's my brother. He's, he's a big fan of the <laughs> of the program. But uh, James is teaching in the University of Dallas, and he says, just for clarity, what are the key performance indicators, and where can I find them? And where can I find? Um, what are the key performance indicators? I'm not quite sure. I don't know if there was a reference uh, there. Maybe you must have said something that had to do with key performance indicators. I myself, I don't know what the 
wouldn't be able to answer it. I don't know if James, maybe if you get a, if we, it's something that David said in, in passing oh. or in reference, I'm not sure in I, reference to what that would have been. I, I think, I think you will find the basic condemnation of liberalism in the, in the encyclicals of Gregory the 16th, Pius the ninth, and also to Leo the 13th and even Pius the 10th. You'll find that. You'll also find uh, a number of writings by um, Father Connell in the American Ecclesiastical Review from about 1948 until about 1953. Um, but those are referenced in my book. All those articles are referenced. And he writes in a very clear uh, style. Uh, and I would recommend that. Yeah. Sorry, David, that was our bad. We was actually the question was sure. in reference to this question here. Um, since your question, what good have the council brought to the church? I'm not anti-Vatican II here. What are the fruits? All the key performance indicators are going in the wrong direction. So I think there was a reference to that, the, the previous question. Sorry. Sure. Sure. Well, I think what happened um, is that the council was, or the interpretation, rather, of the council was hijacked. And that has been used to create these problems that you're seeing. The spirit of Vatican II is really an Americanist spirit, is what I argue in the book. I think it was coined by Michael Novak in the fall of 1964. He was a writer for Time. Um, and um, um, Kaiser was a writer for Time, who was the previous correspondent. Uh, and Kaiser, was, uh, Robert Blair Kaiser told me, he said, um, w this was a conspiracy to undermine the Catholic Church, its authority with its own people. He told me that before he died. Okay, so uh, what you are um, dealing with is you've got the Vatican II Council documents, which have been spun a bad way. But what you do have are some very clear declarations that I just read to you that um, we can work with and move forward on and we build upon. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, that's what we have to do. We have to trust and believe that it is His Church, um, that it's the Holy Spirit that's guiding it. And like we said, the devil is very clever. And at the end of the day, he does, I mean, he wants division. That's what his name means. He wants to divide and separate so that we we are separated from the vine, the true, the true vine, which is his mystical body, the presence of Christ. So um, Ethan Ortiz... How much do you think the church is being influenced today? To what extent is the church hierarchy being misled? Well, I'm sorry to say, but I think the church hierarchy is being misled a great deal. I think they're influenced a great deal by uh, powerful private interests. Um, and I think it is reflected in the things they say and the things they do. Um, I'm sorry to tell you that. Yeah, and we would just have to. Um, so I mean, it is. I think we're in we're in those times where there are you know there's confusion. I don't think it's the only time of the church where there has been. Um, Saint Catherine of Siena was dealing with two popes, and um, I think it was Saint uh, I think it was Ferrer Saint Saint Vincent Ferrer was with one, and she was with the other. You know, and they're both saints. And it just kind of goes to show that there, like, there are going to be hard times. And as Saint Paul says, like these these winds of doctrine are going to blow through, and there's going to be confusing things coming around. But we always have to be, you know, faithful to to the gospel of Christ and and to His Church, and not and not separate ourselves from it. So uh, D says, I think it telling that Pope Paul VI said that Satan's smoke has made its way into the temple <coughs> of God through some crack, 1972? I, I think that's true. I think he realized that, um, gee, you can't trust everybody. And, yeah, and you can't trust the American media. I think he figured that out. And I think he figured out that the church had been, had been infiltrated by people who were not interested in the benefit of the church or the gospel. Um, unfortunately, you know, Paul VI is, is somewhat of a, of a curious figure, an ambiguous figure in a way. I mean, he, um, he did some things that hurt the Catholic societies that still existed at the time. But at the same time, he didn't, he didn't give the Americans, you know, the American powerful private interests what they wanted. And that infuriated him. Yeah. And didn't he have a massive team of specialists and, and everybody who was basically consulting him on 
when Humani Vita was coming out, it was just like the it, the numbers were amazing. That was like him against them. They were kind of like his counselors. And at the end of the day, he went, he came out with what he came out, and everybody was just basically ready to crucify him. Like they all thought that he was their man. He was going to come out and and basically say it was going to be okay to use contraception and other you know other practices. But um, you know, fair play to him. And I think it was that he said to Fulton Sheen that every night he goes to bed on a crown of thorns. Uh, basically, was just like the what he was carrying, you know, in those times at the church. But uh, but praise God, praise God, you know, he he came through, and um, and we've he's a canonized saint, you know. So like if we've if we've got that wrong, like I think we've got everything wrong, like with the canonization there. Um, this is from D. Why was Father Ronner and others who promoted Novel Theology, who had pre censure status prior to Vatican II, then appointed to the drafting of the documents? Well, um, they would have gotten some support from a um, bishop or a cardinal from where they were. Um, the, 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 the council was called in 1959, January 1959, and there were a number of positions that were submitted to the council in July of 1959 by Father Connell, which were very, very relevant. To church and state relations, especially in liberal societies such as America and, and other countries. And um, all the prepared schemas were ultimately thrown out. I think a lot of people know that story. In 1962, after the council started, they started from scratch. And these guys now were called in uh, to help write documents. So they had the backings of powerful people uh, in the Vatican who uh, probably also had some signal from someone outside of the Vatican to bring them in. Yeah. Um, how do you correctly interpret church doctrine and church teachings? Um, boy, that is a, um, that's a good question. In short, you have to look at it in the light of tradition and scriptures and what the church has always held. You look at the, at, at what the fathers of the church taught, and then you have to analyze what the Pope since then taught and uh, the church taught. And the Popes teach most, most specifically, they teach, of course, in their encyclicals, and then also, too, in the, in the various councils. Okay, so look, um, I think from there we can, we can just maybe start wrapping. Um, but... Uh, David, I think you did say some very important things and some very clarifying things. Um, I'm really, really going to encourage people to to buy the book because, like I said, it's a tome. Like, well, it's it's not intimidating, but it's you know it's almost a thousand pages. But there, you guys, what you do have is a well documented, well researched, well studied time put in. Um, you know, thesis that that there was foul play. Like the CIA's there; they had their interests, they had their men. And like you said it so well, at the end of the day, the, the Holy Spirit, he did win. And this is, it's documented, guys. So it's John Courtney Murray, Time Life, and the American Proposition. Um, definitely check it out. And especially in these times, I think it would be well worth it to read it. And then what you also mentioned was the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It sounds so basic. It's so simple. Yeah. But it's like the um, Naaman or Naman, you know, the leper who went and he wanted to get clean. And the prophet of God said, Go bathe in the Jordan seven times. And he almost went back home because he thought it was ridiculous. You know, he wanted something more complex, more interesting, more, you know, intricate. And it was so simple. It was right there at his fingertips, you know, and he did. And he ended up being healed. So the catechism is very similar. Uh, delve into it. Uh, get into your faith. Get into what's there. If you haven't read it, you know, maybe you can pick it up now as like a mid-Lent resolution to read the catechism and know your faith because you guys... You can't leave the church. You can't jump out. We have to stay in with it. We have to stay with Peter. And um, it's not the first time. It's not the first time it's happened. And you're better off. We're all better off staying in. So, David, we appreciate it. Um, thanks for coming on. And uh, we'll keep you and yours in the prayers and uh, keep up keep up the work and the fight. And uh, hopefully more people will, will come to know a bit more about the work you've done and, um, and love the church at the end of the day because we got to love her and fight for her and reveal lies and reveal anything else that might be thrown at her. So thanks, David. Well, thank you, Father, very much. And you're absolutely right about the catechism and staying in the church. And and the catechism, you have to read it very clear, closely and very carefully. But every, everything's there. Right? The traditional teaching, if you want to call it that, is, is there. Catholic doctrine is there. Yeah. So praise God. 
So I guess we'll end with a prayer and the blessing, and um, we'll see you guys next Monday. Um, we're going to have Father Don Calloway on. He's going to be talking a bit about um, St. Joseph and some of his experiences and testimonies with people who have done the consecration and basically how he's the man right now for our times. He's the one who's he's paving the way for the immaculate triumph of his of his wife, his, uh, our Blessed Mother. So in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and never shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, guys. See you next week. God bless. Thank you.